We've just seen some of the most ferocious fires you could imagine. Catastrophic impacts across the Australian landscape and unprecedented in many ways in terms of the scale. As climate change unfolds, it's like a slow crisis. Bushfires are an assault on the whole community and it seems these days they're an assault on the whole world. Australia's known to be the climate change canary for the world. What we were facing here were like scenes from an apocalyptic film. In addition to these fires being incredibly extensive across Eastern Australia, for the first time we saw a range of cascading and compound impacts. The megafires are likely to have had significant health consequences. The truth is that we don't actually know yet because the relevant research hasn't been done. The overwhelming story that the science tells to date is that the risk of these severe fires will increase as climate change unfolds. We had soot on the beaches in Sydney, toxic smoke pools over Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney. Those scenes of 5,000 people, you know, huddled on Mallacoota Beach, that's not the summer holidays of Australia that we all like to think of. Bushfire smoke, when it gets old, it becomes more dangerous. The smoke picks up diesel particles, it picks up allergens, and obviously it's lighter the longer it's staying in the air, so it transports over much greater distances. You saw with the Australian Open, that players like Eugenie Bouchard from Canada actually collapsed as a result of ingesting bushfire smoke. I don't think the Australian Open organiser should have allowed the qualifying rounds to go ahead, given that there had been such hazardous concentrations of fine particles in Melbourne that day. We know a bit about the short-term health effects of these sorts of exposures. So we know that they trigger asthma attacks. We know that they are hazardous for people with pre-existing chronic heart and lung disease, but we know very little about the long-term effects. What's made this most recent season somewhat unique is the impact of the smoke haze. The smoke haze meant people were staying inside, tourists weren't out and about spending money on retail, on food and drinks. So the impact wasn't just on the fire grounds themselves, they're impacting on economies hundreds of kilometres away. If you take the original uh, costs of Black Saturday, which came around $4.5 billion, if they scale appropriately and then you add inflation, then the costs of this bushfire would be in the vicinity of $100 billion. That doesn't include what the economists call intangibles. And the intangibles are those social factors that ripple out from the community. If we include those, it actually comes to $230 billion. It's a pressure cooker environment for people. There's things like unemployment, loss of income, mental health issues. People are facing grief and loss. Along with that comes things like increased drug and alcohol use. After Black Saturday bushfires, one man that we interviewed said he can't get over the fact that he was screaming into the microphone of his CFA truck. He was screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. And he just felt so ashamed of that. I don't think we do acknowledge that in Australia, a bushfire experience is as damaging as it clearly is. Once the media have left and the government has moved on to other things, usually we find a massive spike in post-traumatic stress disorder three years post-event. We're very good at doing the immediate support and bringing in the military, but we don't maintain it. There's uh, a distraction amongst government around the recovery. 
And what the disaster literature tells us is we need that very rapid response. The longer that process takes, the more people start to question their decision to live in that area. And then you have these flow on effects around people drifting away and the whole local economy becomes weaker and weaker. And then you're almost in a bit of a downward spiral. I think the challenges from these bushfires are even bigger than the challenges after Black Saturday because there are implications for our way of life and for the whole world. We need to invest into reducing the fire risk. Most fire agencies here use a fairly rudimentary approach to determining the risk from satellite data. With the work we are doing, the scale of the resolution is significantly higher than what they're currently using. We use satellite imagery, and those satellites are usually operated by the large space agencies. We can provide much more depth to the information and a much higher resolution. We can assess what the state of the vegetation is at very different levels at a 25 meter resolution. That information can then be used in what we call fire spread models that require that vegetation information. And those models can then be used to simulate a fire spread. And we can predict then how it will grow and where it may stop. That would also help with how a response to a fire can be planned how emergency services can be deployed. In that sense, it would be a game changer for those operational agencies. Currently, there's um, a lot of push from the federal government to collaborate with research institutes, but also with federal agencies to ingest more of that type of satellite data. So we've been talking to CSIRO, Geoscience Australia, and various statewide agencies into how that can be done. I probably had never envisaged we would have such a, a spatial extent all at one time. The landscape was simply so dry that it produced this magnitude of fire. With any individual fire, it is impossible to say that fire is due to climate change. However, in this particular case, because of the extent of the fires and the conditions that led to the fires, including extreme heat, it appears that there has been a climate change contribution. To date, there's been a few attribution studies that have looked at uh, the impacts of climate change affecting bushfires, and particularly the bushfire weather. And those studies have shown that, yes, greenhouse gas emissions have contributed to the risks of bushfires and likely contributed to the season that we've just seen. If we wanted to put the ignition causes in order, I would have said natural, mainly lightning, followed by accidental, followed by arson. I wrote an opinion piece, I think it was for the Australian Financial Review. That was a very considered piece on the whole issue of arson. And we know from multiple areas of research, whether it's satellite data or whether it's investigations by police, around about 85% of fires have a human origin. As the fires grew, what happened is that argument took off and people began to argue, oh, it's not climate change, it was all caused by arsonists. And suddenly a brigade of computer bots began spreading it as misinformation all around the world. The phone started going wild saying, is this true? Is it all arson and there's no impact of climate change? And I had to say over and over again, the fires, some of them were lit by arsonists, but climate change was the reason they take off. By the time they get to the size of these fires, where they're beginning to join up, they're becoming megafires. And these megafires then create their own lightning. They sustain themselves. They don't need arsonists anymore. The Monash Climate Change Communication Research Hub has completed a study of the fires that compare the media coverage of these fires with media coverage during Black Saturday. With the current fires, we've found that the linkage to climate change has gone up tenfold. I think with the international reaction to Australia's bushfires, it's been a huge epiphany for climate change journalism and climate change consciousness all over the world. However, we also found there was some degree of climate denialism and we found that there was an over-representation of climate denial stories and narratives within news corporation newspapers. I was part of a group of 
fire and climate scientists who came together and wrote a letter outlining the science behind the impacts of climate change and variability on the fires that we've seen. It was directed to Australia's leaders. We have the data at our fingertips and so I felt a real responsibility, a social responsibility to make a contribution in that space. In terms of having a desired effect on government policy, um, I don't know that it individually will have. The evidence being provided by the climate and fire scientists will feed into the forthcoming Royal Commission. Even though climate change is not seen by government as being a critical part of that Royal Commission, I'm sure that it, it will become. It's interesting to note that the 2019-20 bushfires have probably doubled Australia's short-term emissions. The sooner we act on reducing carbon emissions, the less our children and our children's children will be forced to adapt. There's an awful lot going on in the world at the moment. It would be very easy for us to forget. We must keep an eye on that government in relation to carbon emissions and the future resilience of our society.